Hello, it's Scott Manley here. In the 1990s, the space shuttle grabbed flying saucers from orbit. Don't believe me? I have images and video to prove it. That is indeed a free-floating flying saucer being grabbed by the manipulator arm of the space shuttle. It would be stored in the payload bay and brought back to Earth for scientists to look at. Now, I know a bunch of you out there are saying, See, I knew it, there was something going on. Well, uh, there's also a bunch of you out there that probably know exactly what this is. This wasn't something that came from outer space. This was something that was launched by the space shuttle a few pre days previously. What was it doing? Why was it flying separate from the space shuttle? Well, it was investigating manufacturing in space. And there's a bunch of companies that are looking into space manufacturing right now. Companies like Starforge and Varda Space. But this is something that goes back a long way in the history of NASA as they try to show that NASA can actually contribute to the economy at large rather than just simply providing research and development for cool shit. There were a lot of space manufacturing experiments that flew on like Skylab, Mir, the space shuttle, but most of these were actually looking at microgravity conditions which have all sorts of advantages in terms of reduced convection and absence of sedimentation, but these all flew inside the space shuttle. There was another experiment that flew as a standalone spacecraft deployed from the space shuttle, and this took the form of a giant 12 foot or 3.7 meter diameter wide flying saucer known as the Wake Shield Facility, a name which will be self-explanatory once I explain how it works. There are all sorts of high-tech processes on Earth that require vacuum processes where the oxygen and nitrogen in our atmosphere will literally get in the way and ruin things. One example is the epitaxy process used in semiconductor manufacturing, where crystalline semiconductors can be built up by literally spraying atoms onto a suitable surface. It's like atomic spray paint. If there's any atmosphere in the way, rogue oxygen and nitrogen atoms, they will bounce the atoms around and they will end up getting into the material and contaminating it. Uh, and that will reduce the quality of the material you're creating. Now, we all know that space is a vacuum, and you might be thinking that it would be logical to use this environment for high vacuum processes. Instead of pumping down a vacuum chamber over hours or days, you just open the door and get instant vacuum ready to go. Well, you see, it's not quite that easy. To start with, at the altitude that the space shuttle and most spacecraft operate, it's not nearly good enough of a vacuum for these super sensitive processes that we have on Earth. The other is that the space shuttle and other spacecraft contaminate that vacuum of space, ruining things. You have thrusters that are blasting out nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen compounds, the fuel cells, exhausting water. There's all sorts of contamination, outgassing from the uh, surface of the spacecraft. Things that have been picked up on the Earth during launch that evaporate into space over the mission. And then, of course, there's waste from the space toilet, a complete mess of biological molecules and other unmentionables. In short, the space shuttle left a contaminated wake, or stink, which would ruin any sensitive manufacturing process. And so, a separate spacecraft was dreamed of, the aforementioned wake shield facility. Firstly, it would be able to operate miles away from the shuttle, avoiding any contamination or stench, but more importantly, it would shield its sensitive payloads from the atmosphere in low Earth orbit by shadowing these experiments in its wake. See, as objects move through an atmosphere, they experience increased pressure on the leading side, right? That's your dynamic pressure, your Q factor. But in turn, you get lower pressure on the trailing side. And this is still true even in the highly rarefied atmosphere of low Earth orbit. Objects in orbit are moving many times the speed of atoms in the atmosphere. So these atoms should be unable to catch up with the rear side of a spacecraft. And some calculations that the scientists made showed that they might be able to get pressures that were one millionth of the ambient pressure in low Earth orbit. And that would translate to pressures lower than have ever been achieved in any vacuum chamber on Earth. The wake shield would be the ultimate clean room. In theory, able to make specialized semiconductor components which would be better than anything could come from any earthbound lab. Now, the design. Yeah, picture a 12-foot diameter stainless steel disc. 
It looked a bit like an oversized shield, Captain America shield. Uh, it weighed about, you know, two tons. It was packed with like all sorts of goodies, you know, silver zinc batteries for power, cold gas, nitrogen thrusters, maneuvering systems, attitude control, computers, communications. I had a mass spectrometer for analyzing the environment pressure gauges to actually measure how good a vacuum was being generated. They had uh, like furnaces and heaters for all the epitaxy stuff on the backside. And the whole thing was built to be deployed from the space shuttle cargo bay. It would then fly free for a few days, do its science, and then get scooped back up to bring the stuff back to Earth. And it would be a standalone spacecraft. It had, you know, again, attitude control, sensors, propulsion, power, communications, a computer running everything and it would be carried uh, by the space shuttle into space for this. Now, on the rear, that would be all your equipment that you were going to be putting in the low pressure environment. They would do all the specialized atomic deposition processes, but the spacecraft could also host payloads on the leading edge because there were experiments that would be interested in being free of the space shuttle stank, uh, and in particular, people testing materials robustness against atomic oxygen the leading side of the shield would experience enhanced amounts of atomic oxygen. So the experiments on that side would be, you know, would be get exposed to higher flux and so we could get over faster. Atomic oxygen, by the way, is much more reactive than its conventional molecular version. Without another oxygen atom to cling to, those oxygen atoms are desperate to react with almost anything. And they actually exploited this effect to clean up the facility during the deployment process. Since the wake shield had to be loaded into the payload bay on Earth with humans doing things near it like breathing, uh, that would contaminate the pristine side of the shield and so they would want to clean that up. So what they would do is when they first removed it from its system, they would point it lead on into the you know, atmosphere stream. And so all that atomic oxygen would be streaming onto the surface and attacking any of that biological contamination, removing all those stubborn traces of humans that might interfere with the pursuit of perfect crystals. After a few hours of this cleaning posi position, it would then get flipped around and very carefully deployed, letting it go so that it could then do its thing. Now, of course, you let it go and it'll just hang there. If you, the spacecraft wanted to be on its own, one had to move away from the other. Now, normally the space shuttle would then fire its thrusters and leave, but they did not want that, again, because the space shuttle thrusters throw out all sorts of nasty things. So instead, the wake shield facility had its own propulsion system that used compressed nitrogen. It's inefficient, but it was very, very clean, and it could use that to depart to a safe distance about 30 miles away and then do its science. The epitaxy system that was on it would be a molecular beam epitaxy setup that would then fire those beams of atoms like gallium and arsenic at a heated substrate in that like high quality wake vacuum, building up their crystals layer by layer. Uh, you know, predicted pressures were something like 10 to the minus 14 tor, and that's a vacuum so pure it makes Earth's best vacuum chambers look like dusty garages, right? The high quality vacuum means high quality materials, which meant the semiconductors with fewer defects, higher performance, and applications in everything from faster computers to better solar panels to better lasers. And here's where we get to the flights. And oh, the space shuttle era. It is a treasure trove of, well, not always the right kind of anecdotes. The Wake Shield facility flew three times with a fourth planned but axed due to funding woes. First up, STS-60 on Discovery in February of 1994, the maiden voyage for the Wake Shield facility. Expectations were high. This was supposed to be the proof of concept, deploying the shield to free fly and grow those pristine films. But space had other plans. Attitude control issues cropped up. The thing wouldn't stabilize properly. The crew tried to deploy it, but it ended up just kind of dangling from the space shuttle's robotic arm like a reluctant puppy on a leash. They managed some vacuum measurements while there, and even a bit of epitaxy when it was still attached to the shuttle. But there was no free-flying glory. It still smelled of space shuttle. Success, partial, failure, definitely in the deployment department. Okay, so round two, STS-69, nice. On Endeavour, September of 1995, 
This time, deployment went smoothly on flight day five. The shield free flew for about three days, station keeping 20 to 30 nautical miles away from the shuttle. They planned seven thin film growth runs, but they had interference with the radio, thermal issues, attitude excursions, which is sort of fancy talk for saying it wobbled during orbital noon. All of these things, they threw wrenches in the works and the spacecraft entered safe mode after three successful growth cycles. But the crew extended the flight by a day, squeezing in one more growth. So yeah, they got four films grown, ultra vacuum was achieved for the first time in orbit, and data on the charge hazard, atomic oxygen processing, all that stuff. Not bad, but it was short of their planned seven runs. And the measurements showed that instead of the vacuum being one million times better, it was more like a hundred, largely because the wake shield was actually off-gassing too much. Still, it was good compared to Earth-based systems and a lot faster to pump down when you have half the universe as your exhaust system. It proved the concept, though, showing space manufacturing wasn't just a dream, because it was awake. Get it? Anyway, yeah, the tril trilogy closed out with STS-80 on Columbia in November of 1996, and this was also the longest space shuttle mission at nearly 18 days. The facility was deployed on day four, they had overheating problems, but they still managed some experiments, including more film growth, and they validated the wake vacuum again. But not the full slate of what they planned. Unrelated, by the way, STS-80 was also Story Mudsgraves' last mission, and that's the one where he stood up through re-entry, so he could shoot video through the overhead windows, because Story is a badass. So, expectations versus results? Well, NASA, they and the team, they hyped the wake shield facilities as the dawn of commercial space factories with plans for a fleet of Mark II shields churning out next generation semiconductors. They expected flawless deployments, dozens of film samples for industry and big investments pouring in. In reality, they had technical gremlins, deployment fails, thermal woes, attitude glitches, and only partial experiment completions. They did grow their high-purity gallium arsenide films, purer than earthbound ones with potential for better devices. But the program kind of fizzled after three flights. Flight 4 was going to feature an upgraded spacecraft with solar panels for longer operation, with plans to make enough runs so that they could start sending samples to industry partners. But it wasn't going to happen. The funding dried up, and in 1997, the Wakefield facility got canned. Uh, the hardware ended up getting licensed to Spacehab Inc., which talked about doing the same deployment process from the space station, but with questionable utility at the time and then the Columbia disaster limiting the lifetime of the shuttles, the successor never got developed, never got off the ground, and last I heard, the wake shield facility that flew is sitting on display in a university in Texas, no doubt covered in so much dust that it could never be contaminated to do its job again. Other countries like Russia have talked about building their own versions, but I doubt that'll ever see the you know, light of day. And there have been all sorts of improvements in semiconductor fabrication on Earth, which have eroded some of the potential advantages that could be realized by the systems of the 90s. But now, we once again have companies like Spaceforge looking at this again with launch costs coming down, free flying spacecraft becoming more of a commodity. Maybe one day soon, we'll see some new technologies that will justify the premium of being made in space. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.